Welcome to the Global Archive, a vast storage structure located 800 kilometers north of Norway. It contains the artwork from every national museum. There are pickled animals stacked up two by two. Every film, every book, every scientific report, all stored on banks of servers. But the conditions we are experiencing now were actually caused by our behavior in the period leading up to 2015. In other words, we could have saved ourselves. We could have saved ourselves, but we didn't. It's amazing. What state of mind were we in to face extinction and simply shrug it off? By nature or by history, basically, I was always an introvert. But I guess, you know, the airline business needs, needs a face. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. A personality. Here, 32-year-old entrepreneur Jay Wadia is starting up India's third low-cost airline in 2005. Time for India is now. The time for developing businesses in India is now. He's got 1,200 employees, most of whom have never set foot on an airplane. What are the different kinds of hijackers that you might have? Uniforms. Uniforms, 31st points. Do I care? Do I care? Why are you scared of a little smoke? You're going to be scared and run? Yeah, half fire? It's not a toy. It's not a perfume bottle. You've got to aim it, hold it. That's it. I was in London at the time when Stelios basically uh, you know, created the uh, EasyJet and you know, I was always fascinated with basically how he did it. We'd be offering fares from 600 rupees okay, all the way down to one rupee. How many people can afford a one rupee fare? I would imagine every single Indian can. Okay, your rickshaw driver can, you know, servants. You know, in the year 2005, I mean, you know, having an elite class who can fly in a country of a billion people is ridiculous. Search, visible impacts of climate change leading up to 2010. 101 degrees Fahrenheit. It's the hottest day ever recorded. 700 people are now feared dead after the strongest ever recorded day's rainfall in India's history. Now it's official, the past year has been the driest in Melbourne's history. The desert is advancing at the phenomenal rate of three miles every year. Dozens of Antarctic ice shelves collapsing faster than anyone predicted. 18 countries are underwater and one and a half million people are affected. Quand j'ai vu tout, toutes ces montagnes, cette beauté, enfin, c'est merveilleux, quoi. Et là, vraiment, c'était le coup de foudre. J'ai réussi mon stage de guide en 1956. Fernand Parot has climbed Europe's highest mountain, Mont Blanc, over 150 times. Here he's guiding a family from England. Bonjour. Bien, bonjour. Je suis Pierre. Ça va? Pierre? Pierre. Bonjour. Oui. Uh, ma femme, Lisa. Bonjour. Enchantée. Enchantée. 
Déjà, tu me fais la bise, c'est super. <rire> Merci. Et vous voulez aller vous promener un peu Oui, 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 euh, un peu. Vous voulez marcher sur la mer de glace euh, non, 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 pas marcher. Seulement vu, seulement. Seulement oui. vu, mais oui, oui, oui. on peut aller marcher Oui, 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 oui c'est bon. C est, c est, ça vous... Oui, oui, oui. oui. At 82, Fernand's the oldest guide still working in France. Over his lifetime, he's witnessed huge changes in the mountains. Quand vous étiez jeune, oui. euh, le température, euh, pourquoi euh, Comment Le temps était comment hein, quand j'étais jeune Oui. Je pense que l'été, l'été, on avait aussi de, de grands, grands beaux temps, mais jamais aussi chaud que maintenant. Avant, on met les vaches aussi, les vaches. <rire> elles venaient, elles passaient en bordure de glacier et ah. elles allaient ah, tu... là, manger l'herbe là. Oui, oui. Maintenant, maintenant. C'est bien, oui. manger. Manger. À la... à... Maintenant, fini. Oui, fini. oui. Prends l'échelle, prends l'échelle. Avant, pas d'échelle, pas d'échelle. Partir comme ça sur le glacier. On voit très bien. Donc, oui. il, il a aussi reculé de 150 mètres depuis 1945. Oui, je pense. Hein. Il faudrait voir avec les géologues, mais je crois, d'après les yeux. Maintenant, cette année, ils ont rajouté la dernière échelle. Donc, le glacier, il a fondu de 7 à 10 mètres cette année. Et là, il va encore fondre avec le beau temps. Extraordinary to think that these are the Alps in December. Here in Chamonix, as across the Alps, there is a dramatic lack of snow and exceptionally warm temperatures. It is a glimpse into the future. More than half the ski resorts in Europe could shut down in the next 50 years because of global warming. So we won't be able to go skiing. Big deal. But the thing is, it's not that, is it? That's the whole point. The fact that you can't go skiing anymore, or, you know, that the glasses are melting, is not really the point. The point is that that's a signal that, basically, the Earth is destabilizing. And all the, all the norms that have allowed life to you know, exist as it, as, it, as it has done uh, are changing. Avec le réchauffement, c'est différent. J'ai l'impression maintenant qu'on n'a plus que deux saisons. L'hiver rejoint l'été sans qu'on s'en aperçoive. Quoi. quest ce qu'il faut faire. Ouais. Je ne sais pas. Je ne sais pas. Les glaciers, les glaciers reculent toujours. List, climate change, major events, up to the present day. This is a couple of days before Katrina struck. Most people are following the evacuation order and getting out of the city. But New Orleans-born Albin Duvernay had no intention of moving. I got up Saturday morning and there was a buzz in the neighborhood. Everybody's running around and I was like, what's up, what's up? You know, hurricane's coming. So I checked on the web and sure enough, all of the models had it aiming right for us, bullseye. This is a monster, and it's coming. Walked through the house a few times, putting things up. You know, my, my silk rug from Nepal up on a top shelf, and my guitar, and, and you know, just, you just do these things, you know? I mean, another way to do that is get all your stuff and go. That's option one, probably the best option. I didn't grow up in that option. 
Marlin. Alvin collected his 84-year-old father and then barricaded the two of them inside his house as the hurricane approached. You stare Mother Nature in the eye. Usually she's fairly benign. Then she comes along methodically, ruthlessly, you know, and, and then she stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with you and dares you. Dares you. Go ahead, get your best equipment out. Go ahead, do it. Let's dance. I think one's got to be very careful about attaching uh, a particular event to global warming. But nevertheless, the intensity of hurricanes is related to surface sea temperature. So increased intensity of, uh, of hurricanes is associated with global warming. By first light, the water in Alvin's house was chest deep and still rising. So he helped Alvin Sr. into their boat and headed for dry land. And at this point, the boat's floating, so it's no big deal to launch the boat. It's launched. There's no landmarks, really, to speak of. That's a real different perspective, driving through your neighborhood at tree level. Then, all of a sudden, you realize there's a lot of people who stay behind. There was no Coast Guard or police or most of our National Guard was elsewhere in the world. Iraq, Afghanistan. Alvin rescued over 100 people and their pets over two long days, including a 95-year-old man and a six-week-old baby. When that little basket came out of the window, that was, that was a pretty special time. Um, and just this peaceful, eyes closed. Um, I mean, it just, it just stops you in your tracks. Just dead stop and said, take a breath, you know. There's nothing more impressive than that. Alvin's neighbors were the lucky ones. Hurricane Katrina was America's worst weather-related event to that date. But it was just a taste of what was to come. It is our fault. After years of debate, some of the world's top scientists have concluded... Unequivocal is the word they use. Human activity is... Contributing to changes in our Earth's climate. And that issue is no longer up to debate. In Andamat, they've covered a glacier with a special protective sheet to reduce its summer melt. One way I do my bit for the environment is turning to 30 with Ariel. This is offsetting all those flights that I take, that I have to for my job. David Cameron What's even that? wears recycled shoes made from old fireman's trousers. Despite all the efforts to control pollution and its effect on our climate, the level of greenhouse gas emissions has reached a record high and shows no signs of being reversed. Despite the Kyoto Treaty and all the talk of reducing emissions of carbon dioxide, levels of this key greenhouse gas are rising faster than ever. 6.30 a.m. on a cool autumn morning and Alvin's heading off to work, searching for more oil. Ironically, the oil infrastructure off the coast of New Orleans suffered major damage during the hurricane. But Shell moved fast to carry out repairs and just nine months later, the rigs are online and everyone's back at work. Oil was formed when ancient plant life in the oceans absorbed energy from the ancient sun. As these plants died, they settled on the ocean floor along with the dead bodies of tons and tons of ocean creatures. Over the millennia, temperatures increased and the organic matter was gradually cooked until the sun's energy was stored inside oil. 150 million years later, Shell's geologists analyze where the oil might be, then drill three miles down into the seabed to collect samples. Here you are, Al. Did you stop? Thank you, brother. We get the samples and analyze them for the fossil contents, the microscopic fossils. And it's just another geoscientific tool in order to improve your possibility of, of finding oil. In my opinion, probably arrogantly so, but it's pretty high calling actually to try to do that, to try to figure out or maybe take apart, uh, you know, time itself. Go back a few thousand years and the 
energy available to grow our crops or feed animals was limited by the daily sunlight falling on the earth. But now we use the energy equivalent to hundreds of years of sunlight every single year. Every part of modern life is now literally made of oil, from CDs and plastic bags to medicine and computers, from clothes and carpets to cosmetics and cell phones. It's truly a wonderful and necessary substance. Then there's our food. Each calorie we eat uses nearly 100 oil calories to produce, package, refrigerate, transport, and fossil fuel produced fertilizers now feed a couple of billion or so people who could not otherwise be sustained. It would be prudent for humanity to carefully use the remaining oil to build a new society run without it. Instead, we're burning up tens of millions of barrels every day, so it will be gone. It will run out, leaving pretty much none for future generations even though we in the oil industry are working our asses off looking for and finding this magical substance. Yeah, right. Go ahead, push it back! And then you see it, and you smell it, and, you know, it's greasy and, you know, ugly and smells so much like money, it's just beautiful, you know. 13 billion pounds in 2005. That's one and a half million pounds an hour. 400 pounds a second. And a hefty chunk of those profits came from here, Nigeria where most of the population lives on less than one dollar a day. This is the water we drink. There's a lot of uh, frog inside, yes. toads. Every, any germs you can find inside here. Yes. With the help of a microscope, you can see the disease we have inside. And we thought that if, shell, if we introduce shell into this community, that, that we change all this water, but it still remains the same. This is our health center. 22-year-old Laefa Malin has an ambition to train as a doctor and then work in her home village, Kokojabane, where Shell started building this medical center. So it has been like this for three years now. But we are still pleading that they should come and finish it. Like hundreds of other community projects across the Niger Delta, construction has been abandoned. Shell maintains that's because of the risk of kidnapping. 13% of the oil revenue is supposed to be spent on community development. But the local people's share is almost all lost to the corrupt political system. So despite being in the most profitable oil region in West Africa, Laefa's village has no health service, no secondary school, no electricity, and no drinking water. I think in 2004, a lot of people died. A lot. I think it's up to 20 persons. Children mostly. Even my, my mother's child, that's my sister, she even died of cholera. I think the death of my sister motivated me a lot to become a good medical doctor, not just a doctor, a good one. The water is what gives me the typhoid fever. You know, it took a lot of money to become a medical student. I need to pay for my accommodation and all that thing. And I'm going to put on nice clothes. That means I will start the fishing from this year to maybe four years' time. I you put your paddle that way. This way. Then, yes, like, no. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. The fishing is not good because of the oil spill. They're killing most of the fish. And we don't even have big fish again, just small ones. Oh yeah, we work back good at that. Can it dip up? <laughs> Sometimes the oil will be all about the old fish. So you have to wash the fish, maybe with Omo. They're talking in the news that we have produced one or one million barrels of oil today. But instead of we being rich, we are getting more poor. Laefa is describing a phenomenon known as the resource curse. Paradoxically, finding oil usually increases a country's poverty, as the oil wealth is concentrated in the hands of a few, so the agriculture, education, and health system of the country become neglected and often collapse. The local people's health problems are compounded by gas flares, burning night and day throughout the Niger Delta. Asthma, bronchitis, skin diseases and cancer have all been linked. 
that gas is found alongside oil, but as it's dangerous to transport, it can't easily be sold to overseas markets. It could be used for cooking and heating within Nigeria, but building the infrastructure is expensive, so the oil companies just burn it off. The flares emit about 70 million tons of carbon dioxide every year, more than the annual emissions from 10 million British homes. Because they have uh, money and they are uh, strong companies, they, they just do whatever they like. Why are American cities designed so it's almost impossible not to have a car? Why were a hundred railways in cities like New York, Philadelphia, and Los Angeles bought up and then deliberately destroyed? Why did the electric car get scrapped? Why were we, along with Australia, the only two countries not to sign the original Kyoto Climate Treaty? Why was an oil company lobbyist allowed to change official government reports on global warming? Why was the same PR firm employed by the tobacco industry to persuade the public that smoking is healthy, then employed by the oil industry to convince us there was still doubt about climate change? Alternative energy has been available for 50 years. Why have we barely used it? Why were solar panels taken off the White House? Because, right from the early days of the industry, the oil men and their obscene profits have had an unhealthy influence on the people running our country. And now, they are the people running our country. And they're providing the cash, too. Oil business isn't just in bed with the government, it is the government. Here, Layefa is going to a nearby village, Odiyama, that was massacred by the government. The village was involved in a dispute about ownership of a piece of land on which Shell planned to drill for oil. The government claimed that the village was harboring terrorists and, when they sent the military in to find those terrorists, the villagers opened fire on the soldiers. Onoa. Onoa. Layefa has gone to hear the village's side of the story from Momiaka Weked. 14 speed bulls mm. was coming, I mean. filled with military men. Mm. Then we saw four gun boats. The next we hear, boom, house is burning. So we said, hey, let's run. The whole island is shaking. There was, a, there was a building here. They come and burned it down. So the one that managed to escape ran down, down into the forest. And most of, even two kids, we had died here. Two kids. So you stayed? I kidding. stayed two weeks in, in this forest. forest, yes. No food? No food. You no didn't just start Plucking this. leaves. But right in the bush, you can imagine what will happen to water there. We drank those water, and so many children died. By then, I was pregnant. Mm. So when I delivered this, because of the dirty water we drank, so when I gave back to him, he was stolen and vomiting. Then I lose him. Amnesty International investigated the massacre and concluded that, although the government was responsible for the killings, Shell Nigeria should have made sure that their activities did not contribute to the conflict. Those ones that, has, that stayed, they gathered them up, beat them up, raped some of our girls. This was my grandfather's compound. He was living with his family. Oh. They burned that down his camp and killed him. They burned him? They shoot him. They shoot him? Yes. Those little children that was lying in our houses, they, they burned them off. Even the old men and women, the ones that are blind, they burned them off. Human history is littered with the corpses of people who had stuff worth stealing. Animals. Water. Shiny things. Fertile land.
spices. Hmm, nutmeg slice. Tea? But when it came to stuff worth pinching, one continent had it all. Ivory, copper, cotton, rubber, wood, tin, gold, diamonds, and people. As cheap energy, slaves were unbeatable until a less troublesome energy source was discovered and a new era began. Human numbers increased five times over and with each person wanting more and more stuff, oil became the resource worth fighting for all around the world. went to war in Iraq. According to former Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan, it's simple, three-letter answer, not WMD, it's OIL. I am saddened that it's politically inconvenient to acknowledge what everyone knows, that the Iraq war is largely about oil. You might read the ex-chairman of Shell that said over the weekend that oil could hit over $150 a barrel as world production begins to peak. Not really good news for a country whose entire economy not to mention its entire way of life is based on cheap oil. Throughout our history, the deal was we left the world in a better place than we found it. That was progress. The wheel, the rule of law, penicillin. It was our covenant to our children and grandchildren. My children weren't angry with me for breaking the covenant. They were too busy trying to stay alive to waste energy on blame, trying to negotiate their way through food riots and refugee camps and the collapse of society. But I think my grandchildren would have been angry had they survived into adulthood.
Salut papy Bonjour Jean Bonjour Jean Des bisous Papy Des ah, bisous ouais, Ça va Ouais Ah ouais. j'ai mis Qu'est-ce que t'as fait le problème, c'est nous qui l'avons fait. Toujours évolution, évolution, évolution. On demande toujours de plus en plus à la planète. Mes parents ont vu les avions, la voiture arriver. Hein. Maintenant, les jeunes, ils ont leur voiture pour aller à l'école bientôt. Ils sont plus évolués que nous parce qu'ils ont beaucoup plus de choses, ils voient beaucoup plus de choses que nous à la télévision, mais ce n'est pas dit qu'ils soient plus heureux. Quand on était jeune, on n'avait pas l'eau, il fallait aller chercher l'eau, donc on, on faisait attention comme pour l'électricité. Aujourd'hui, il fait jour, il, fait le soleil, il y a le soleil. On n'a pas besoin de la lumière. Et ça, nos parents savaient nous le dire, nous. Mais je crois que nous, on n'a pas su le dire à nos enfants. Skiing in the desert. Heating the air, lighting empty offices. Energy is so ridiculously cheap, it makes perfect economic sense to just piss it away. China is the new bad guy, because they are building a new power station every four days. But a quarter of that energy makes stuff for us. Western companies pay Chinese workers crap wages to make crap plastic toys, then ship them to Europe and wrap them in more plastic. Punters drive to the out-of-town megastore in their gas guzzlers. Plastic toy in plastic box goes into plastic bag. Two days later, toy is broken and back it goes to a Chinese landfill where it stays for about hmm, 50,000 years. Eight hundred times more energy wasted and ten thousand times more expensive for you. It's a tricky decision. Quand j'ai construit ma maison en 63-65, ils construisaient aussi le tunnel du Mont Blanc. Mais on se n'est pas aperçu tout de suite et on s'est laissé envahir par les voitures et après les camions. Au début, ça passait quelques camions, mais maintenant, ils ont élargi la route, qui est, elle est à quatre voies. Il y avait 4000, 5000 camions qui passaient par jour. Une pomme de terre, deux pommes de terre. Trois, quatre, cinq, six, la plupart, ils viennent du nord avec des pommes de terre et elles passent, ça passe le tunnel, elles vont se faire laver en Italie, même au fond de l'Italie et, et elles reviennent après, mais en purée, quoi. Et le lait, ils, ils le transportent pour faire les yaourts et, et, et après, ils reviennent. C'est fou, quoi. fou.
هيك اكبر مني سرقته اجت الطيارة عبالهم القوم كان لابس اواعي سود وليلون بلاستيك كبت النار ما تذبوله كبت النار احترق الى واحد اسهل اني لزق البيت وما خلى عنه جينا شوية شوية اول شيء كان يعبرونا اخوي مالك كم شو كم يرجعون بي حط ولا مدري ثمان مرات رجعوا لو ما عنده تلفون وجمالك وما عنده تلفون انطي تلفونك خلي يصلح كنادى لي انطي الجمعه بيبي ديش اشوف الامريكان انا بعيني انا كرايتهم والله عشان قلت لهم ابوي هاي الجزيرة انتصلوا صفر صفر سبعة تسعة أربعة خمسة الجزيرة طالعة هون عندكم بتربحوا أربع سيارات هامار وأربع سيارات جيم Lots of ideas have tried to take over the world but there's only one winner 3,000 adverts bombard us every day Tenors will be happier, more attractive and with better skin, if only we buy their products. Together, they create within us an insatiable desire to buy more and more stuff. Americans have been advertised at longest, and they now each consume twice as much energy as a European, nine times more than a Chinese person, 15 times more than an Indian, and 50 times more than someone from Kenya. If all six and a half billion people here on Earth consume like Europeans or Japanese, we'd need two more planets worth of resources. If everyone consumed like Americans, Australians and Canadians, we'd need another four. And in 2040 or so, when there's about nine billion of us, we'll need two more again. Capitalism's only goal is ever-expanding growth. But ever-expanding growth on just the one not-expanding planet is impossible. The current economic system is disastrous, not just for the planet, but for most people too. 400 years of capitalism has allowed the richest 1% to take 40% for themselves, leaving just 1% for the poorest half. But anyone wanting to live differently is thwarted at every turn. With profit the only measuring stick, destroying the planet is written into the system and runaway climate change is a not very surprising result. Color. You know, like today, you know, Orange Telecom, they have orange and black. Our logo is for us in color. Now, everything changes in the economy the minute you have an airline moving in, because people can basically do business a lot faster. If businesses grow a lot faster, people have more disposable income, then, you know, consumerism sets in. And, you know, we're the verge where basically consumerism is setting in. Just moving a lot like America. Me, I'm not happy living this kind of life, but at least at 23, I should be in better place. I always want her place to be like in America, in a comfortable house, flashy cars, drinking good water, eating good food. I always want our people to, at least my people, me, myself, to live that kind of life. It's a beautiful life. If you're living that kind of life, you won't even like to die. You just want to stay on Earth forever. <laughs>
Glide slope. Glide slope. Here, Jay travels to Airbus headquarters in France as they'll be supplying him with 26 planes in his first three years. We have only 200 aircraft commercially flying in India. China has 800. So ultimately, you know, we have a very long way to go. Playing catch up with China or catch up with Europe or, you know, say America, one airline, Southwest, have 417 aircraft. That's double the amount of aircraft we have as a country. So uh, this is not, of course, your final uh, design choice, and, but... You know, one simple sentence for me summarizes it all. Things can only get better. My main house was, it had 10 feet of water and it marinated in that for, in that sludge for, you know, three weeks almost. So the current state of my house, it has been demolished. It's a flat piece of property waiting for another house to go on that. I lost everything, everything that I owned. I mean, everything from family heirlooms to the paper towels sitting on your kitchen counter and everything in between. It goes on and on. Two beautiful, beautiful oak trees I did not lose. You know, local indigenous, Quercus virginianus, live oaks, you know, that sprawl all, all over the place. Beautiful, beautiful. Thing. That's what I have left, two oak trees and, a, and an empty lot. Everything else is gone. That sucks. Losing everything you have, you have, it's, it, it's, it's so overwhelming. And the grief that comes with that is just, it's, it's, it's profound. We had an unspoken collective pact to pretend climate change wasn't happening, as though as long as we ignored it hard enough, it wouldn't be true. Not absolutely everyone. A few were shouting, fire. climate change is that the effects of our emissions today are not actually realized in terms of the temperature for 30 to 40 years, so there's this time lag in the system. Which makes it difficult for us humans to respond because we're evolutionarily equipped to deal with very immediate threats like advancing armies or dangerous animals. We're not so well equipped with dealing rationally with very long-term problems like climate change. So we have to act now to stop something happening in the future. If we wait until the full temperature effects are already upon us, then it's far too late to stop. If you remember one single number above all else, make it two degrees. Now, everyone in the world, pretty much, the European Union, big multinational corporations, Greenpeace, political parties, all agree that we have to stabilize global temperatures within two degrees above pre-industrial levels. And the reason for that is because if you cross that threshold, then there are tipping points in the Earth system which could drive the warming process essentially out of control. Huge amounts of carbon could be coming out of the world's trees and the soils. Methane could be coming out of the permafrost in Siberia. And it's that extra input of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Which then leads us up to worst case scenarios to six or more degrees and the eventual wipeout of most of life on Earth. So our emissions have been going up between, let's say, 1950 and now. They need to level out, stabilize, and then decline just as rapidly to sustainable levels about an 80% cut by 2050. But crucially, to keep the temperature rise within two degrees, this point of stabilization needs to be at around 2015. And so that means really the time timeline we've got, ticking clock, is that we have to stabilize global emissions within just seven years from now, as we speak, 2008. And the scale of this task to 
achieve a transformation to a low carbon economy for the entire entirety of human civilization is it's obviously it's a huge monumental task probably the greatest that humanity's ever faced remember the english family who went to see the glacier they're back home in Cornwall, southwest England, inspired to start tackling their own energy wasting. It says that the average individual in the UK is responsible for emitting 10 tonnes of greenhouse gas a year. They're calculating exactly how much climate change gases their family currently produces and how it can be reduced. Yeah, but that's the average individual. There are five of us here. Ah, uh, Whichever way you look at it, this isn't good. We produce about half of our food and um, we try and keep our consumption of meat and dairy down. Um, my car runs on chip fat and we do cycle when we can. We've just got our own wind turbine which will produce all our own electricity. We're aiming to cut down to about one tonne each per year, which is apparently the sustainable amount that the world's trees and plants can reabsorb. But the big problem is flying. Just one return flight, say London to New York, would blow our entire carbon budget for about three and a half years. Apparently, other than setting fire to a forest, flying is the single worst thing an ordinary individual can do to cause climate change. So it's a bit of a dilemma because we've just been invited to go skiing in France. They're now flying from Newquay, which is our nearest airport, it's like, 40 minutes from here, to Bergerac, which is like, you know, an hour Very and a tempting. half or something from it. <laughs> and literally, we could leave here in the morning. There's, we live, like, in Cornwall. We could leave Cornwall in the morning and be in Bergerac by sort of, for lunch, after lunch. But if you actually think this is going to cause the death of people, it's actually going to affect people and make that direct connection, then it is a really scary thought. Obviously, us not flying to France or not flying wherever is, not, is hardly going to solve the problem. But it's down to what you think is the correct thing to do. Because everyone else is doing it. I mean, that's not a good reason to do anything. You, know, you have to look at the terrible things in our history that everyone regrets now. You know, massacres, the Holocaust, etc. And uh, you know, a lot of that was just going along with what was the predominant thinking at the time. I'm almost jealous of the time five, ten years ago when I could just jump on a plane with impunity. And just, I didn't even think about it, it was just blissful. There's, there's no, no moral dilemma there whatsoever. Needless to say, they didn't take that flight. And joining a climate change protest march may not be everybody's idea of a tenth wedding anniversary, but Piers and Lisa have shared ideals from the moment they met. My friend, we went along to the party together, and she just basically took me straight over to Piers and said, Hey, look, you, you know, uh, Piers, this is Lisa, you know, uh, da, 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 da. and that was it. That was it. We just and spent the whole evening talking about wind turbines. Piers has been developing wind farms in Africa, America, and Britain for over 15 years but he knows that they will only help solve the climate crisis as a small part of a total reordering of Western society. And there's still this idea that somehow we have to find the solution, you know, the silver bullet. No single renewable source is going to be the solution, absolutely not. And Piers doesn't think much of the other option, whereby everyone crosses their fingers and hopes that a miracle technology will be invented in time. I'm not saying we shouldn't be developing other stuff, absolutely, we should be. We should be throwing everything at it. But you've got to make use of what's available now. And in the UK, we've got a great wind resource. Um, we've just got to bite the bullet and go for it. Piers has proposed a new wind farm at Airfield Farm in Bedfordshire, central England. He could have 15 turbines installed and generating 30 megawatts of electricity within a year. Well, we're the leaders of the revolution, aren't we? Yeah. 
That's it. Outrage faces. <laughs> Edward, I've lost your face again. Sorry, chap. You can just cut. That's it. Yeah, good man. Right, OK. <laughs> Well, the protest balloon is now going up, but while that's happening, I'll just explain where we are. This is the site of an old World War II bomber base. Phone box. We all have a thumbs down as well. <laughs> UK-wide surveys point to about 70 to 80% in favour of wind farms as a concept. The difficulty is when you've got one on your own doorstep, and then, uh, then it's the sort of not-in-my-backyard syndrome. Jim, what's the problem? Well, the problem really is that this is one of the least windy sites in the country. I hope it's not going to get too windy tomorrow when it wraps itself around the church. Well, I live in Coddington and we're going to be absolutely surrounded by these high masts and they're going to obliterate the view. What it normally always comes down to with wind farms is aesthetics. You know, everything else is basically put together to try and back up the ultimate thing, and the ultimate thing is they don't want to, to spoil their view. But I'm a bit concerned about the uh, low-level noise as well. The wind farm site is right next to the world-famous Santa Pod drag racing strip. Anybody you ask here, nobody's against wind energy. That's, yeah. that's the point. Yeah. It's against inappropriate wind energy, right. energy use. OK. Hypnotic. Mm. You're driving along and you tend to see the sails revolving and you're, you're not concentrating on the driving. Ernie Braddock will benefit financially having turbines on his farm, but now he's in conflict with his neighbour, Victoria Reeves. Well, everyone is very <coughs> unhappy about it. We're going to lose the value on our properties. No, we're we're not going to be able difference. to sleep. It will no, make a difference. Ernie, you have no idea. Believe me. According to Victoria, they, they stopped a wind farm up in Scotland on their other estate in Scotland. Um, back in the mid-90s, and that was a great victory. It can't rely on the wind. It can only deliver... It's only an additive. It a, means an that, additive. It means Do you mean additional? The, yes, it is it additional. It prolongs the resources. Put it that way. No, Ernie, it doesn't. Oh, it's got to. It does nothing of the sort. It's got to. Believe me. <laughs> it's got to. <laughs> it's an emotional campaign. It's about fear, mostly based on complete bollocks, frankly. Um, but never mind. Facts are not a problem, you know? It's a fair fight. <coughs> Yeah. And I hope you lose. All right. This is August 2005, just after Mumbai's worst ever floods, and a couple of months before Jay's first flight. So I can't see an issue there. Let's Secondly, see you, Grandpa. And, uh, you know. Jay has descended from one of India's richest and most powerful business dynasties. They've pioneered everything from shipbuilding in the 18th century to internet services in the 21st. In a roundabout way, his privileged upbringing sparked the idea for the low-cost airline. What do you want me to do? I'm going to the airport. Throughout basically my life, from a young age, I mean, I used to hang out with basically in terms of, you know, the servants, kids, you know, and that sort of stuff. And, you know, when you go home, you say, you know, you suddenly think, why the hell do I have so much? And these guys have nothing. You know, that sort of shit. And that constantly, constantly, constantly ate me up. You know, everyone is here for a purpose. The idea is to realize what your higher purpose is and then understand how you're going to fulfill it. And eventually, I realized what my higher purpose was. It was to ensure that I eradicated poverty. Jay volunteers at a charity which helps villages lift themselves out of poverty. But even by private jet and jeep, it's a five-hour, 900-kilometer journey. Hiring a private jet basically in terms of cost as much as a village does, uh, you know, you take a village from below the poverty and put it above the poverty. So effectively in terms of it defeats the purpose. And therefore I decided to, you know, try the trains. From Bombay it takes about 26 hours. I said to myself, wow, this is just incredible. You know, people pay good money and still have to basically put up with this rubbish. 15 million people travel by train in India every single day. Jay's dream is to get them all off the trains and into the skies.
we're not at war at the moment. It's not a war. But if people actually recognise the full implications of what's in store for us, they would be treating it like a war. They only got to take Airfield Farm, for example. I mean, that was a US airbase. You know, people flew out of there and died for a cause which was massive at the time, a global problem. And we have ourselves now have a real global problem that needs that kind of level of commitment. There are many, many other industries that need to be looked into first before aviation. It's not, a, it's not a question about choosing one industry to target, you know, because ultimately we all contribute to, to, to greenhouse gases, we all contribute to the crisis that we have today with the planet. So ultimately in terms of, you know, ensuring that our, our planet is safe and healthy uh, is each one's, uh, you know, job task, um, whether you do it in your own way by using less tissue paper, using less paper so the trees are not cut, buying green cars or not flying. You know, obviously, if you're not if you're not doing it, the demand goes down. The demand goes down. The supply goes down. You know, life's about demand and supply, or supply demand. We don't catch a lot of fish anymore, so I decided to join into another business, that's diesel business, to make quick cash for my college. Right now, because of the fuel uh, scarcity, most of the uh, filling station have all shut down, just closed because there's not, nothing to sell. So people get from the black market. I buy diesel every Thursday. I sell them to one Mrs. Uh, Rebecca. She sells it to our customers, I don't really know. I don't want to know about them, but I know she sell them to our customers. It is fresh food, but it has a larger profit than selling the fish. Strange, watching these film fragments. It's like looking through binoculars observing people on a far-off beach, running around in circles, fixated on the small area of sand under their feet as a tsunami races towards the shore. Here's Alvin. He's just taken early retirement after 30 years on an oil industry salary and is planning to spend his later years outside enjoying nature. Oh, certainly I'm an ecologist and an environmentalist. I really don't have a problem squaring that working for an oil company that I feel has done a pretty good job in, in being environmentally friendly. When I uh, started working in the oil industry in about the mid-70s, it was a clear path for me as a scientist coming out of college. And I didn't know the detail of what goes on in the industry, uh, the goods and the bad. But indeed, every industry has that, the goods and the bad. Would I do it again, knowing what I know now? Of course I would do it again. I mean, you, you need to work, you need to do something. The worst example I've had is a lady, an old lady, came up to me in a public exhibition 
and gave me a cutting from a newspaper with a picture of a guy being shot. Local anti-campaigns were one of the key factors stopping about 80% of the proposed wind energy project in Britain. Had they all been built, 10% of our electricity would have been non-polluting. And how the heck are we meant to persuade people like India and China that they should develop in a more sustainable way when we're not prepared to even accept, you know, the old wind farm in the landscape? So how's it going? All right, yes. Not too much trouble? Not really, no. Nobody's punched me up yet, anyway. <laughs> Good. Piers has come back to Ernie's farm with a plan to make the turbines less visible, trying to kick-start the planning process that the anti-campaign has now held up for 18 months. Another 18 months of climate change, another 18 months where I've been able to do nothing about it. Yeah, I feel really, really fucked off with it. I mean, it's, uh, you know, you must be feeling the same as me. It's just, I mean, how long have we got? <laughs> Piers' compromise reduces yeah. the number of turbines from 15 down to nine. This is still the equivalent electrical power to for 11,000 homes. Yeah. yeah. So it's still, there's still a lot of power. Exactly the opposite is happening to the very thing that needs to happen. These things need to be speeded up, oh, well, and actually, like... they're getting slowed down. Plenty of politicians are talking about it, but when it comes down to it, it's just not happening. It's just not happening, folks. Governments will only go as far as the population demands, and that means mass protest on an unprecedented scale. Direct action like this is essential if you're going to turn an issue round in a short period of time. We've found that many, many times in the past, from the suffragettes onwards. The very fact that the crisis is taking place within our generation, and it's happening right now, means that we are tremendously powerful people. So this position of despair and I can't do anything and there's no point, it's completely illogical. It's exactly the opposite. À un moment, ils ont pensé aussi doubler le tunnel. Donc, à ce moment-là, les chamoniards se sont enfin réveillés. Donc il y a une association de dire non au camion, donc il y a moins de, de transport inutile. Il y a, il y a toute une équipe qui, qui, qui se bat vraiment, mais on n'est pas, on, on pas assez nombreux. Et je ne sais pas si on aura autant de force pour faire reculer ce lobby routier. Quoi. Les gouvernements à l'Europe et tout ça. Ça, c'est des personnes intelligentes. Mais il faut aussi qu'elles qu fassent du travail et qu'elles ne pensent pas qu'à la réélection. Il n'y a pas de shortage de matter dans cette species. We can do some amazing things. But I don't think we've been very smart about, about how we use our resources, how we quite literally burn up something as beautiful and useful as oil. Literally burn it up. That's it. It's gone. It's done. I think most people were becoming disenchanted by this point. We'd stopped believing that this was the golden era of human civilization and started questioning our collective values. All I can hope is incredible disasters like Katrina and the horrible wars and whatnot that are going on around the world will, will snap us out of it. I'd like to see us heading in the right direction for, for the good of mankind. I still believe in chasing dreams. Oh, you got me. Jack and Rocks. Perfect. You know what I like. I had my share. I drank my fear. And even though I'm 
satisfied. I'm hungry still. Before this disaster, I had a lot of stuff. I was a, a classic consumer. Two years later, I've learned a lot about happiness and the pursuit thereof. So here's the light. And every joy. The happiness is not in the latest gadget, the latest the electric toothbrush or something like that. All of that stuff, it's just not, it's just not the stuff of life. Not for me anymore. Here's the light. Here's the love. Here's to you. Climate scientists can estimate how much of the remaining fossil fuels we can safely burn. This amount is called the global cap. Under this proposal, the world's governments would make a binding international agreement detailing how to distribute the global cap. The earlier the start date, the greater the chance of not triggering runaway climate change. The total global emissions for the first year, say 2012, will be set at their current level. Every year following they'd shrink until, by about 2065, they're almost zero. Initially, each country would be allocated an emissions quota according to how much they currently consume. But this would change over time. America would slash its emissions 90% from its current over-consuming position. Europe too would decrease massively, as would China. But India and Africa would increase until, by about 2025, each human being on the planet would have equal rights to the Earth's resources. Equity is the only option morally, and also practically, as developing countries won't sign up to anything less. The total emissions would then keep decreasing every year, until by 2065 we'll have weaned ourselves off fossil fuels and prevented the worst impacts of climate change. As to how each country divvies up its share to its citizens, there are various options on the table, the most promising of which is individual carbon rationing. Mr. W.S. Morrison is here to explain. If in the course of the war, we are short for a time of this or that article of food, rationing will give everyone, rich and poor alike, an equal share of all that's going. Under this scheme, everyone in the UK would be allocated an annual carbon allowance. Stored electronically, rather like a supermarket loyalty card, points would be deducted every time we buy or use non-renewable energy. For example, using electricity to power appliances in the home. Or travelling somewhere by plane. Or even buying petrol for your car. The best way you can help is by rationing yourselves. I'm sure that all of you will buy your fair share and no more. Airports were expanding all over the world to cope with the exploding number of cheap flights we were all demanding. And Jay was doing everything he could to join the party. Ultimately, the art is to, you know, hug and then kick. She thinks that PSF is payable. You're saying the PSF is not payable. What's wrong with you? Now. Yes or no? Did I ask you that question or did I not ask you that question? You're suspended. You're suspended. Both of you come to my office right now. Does it take bloody more than 10 minutes to clean this? Keep paint with you. It's one day's work. <laughs> Maintaining my brand means something to me, OK? If I see my step ladder like this, and if I find one dirt, you'll be fired. OK? <laughs> Mr. J. Wadier, yes. I would like to <laughs> give you your air operator's permit to Thank start you. the <laughs> J. 
June the 11th, 2007, in a hotel room in Bedford, Piers is polishing his speech for tonight's showdown with the local planning committee. This committee can approve this application. If you do, you will show courage and leadership. He has just six minutes to convince them to approve his wind farm. I'm absolutely confident that if you approve this project, you'll look back on the decision and say, thank goodness we said yes. But the committee rejected Piers's application, saying that his wind farm would be conspicuous and out of place in the Bedfordshire landscape, that it would decrease enjoyment of nearby footpaths and negatively impact a listed building and an ancient monument. In other words, it would spoil the view. Well, we're delighted that it's been refused, yes. Well, it's a wonderful result. It just shows if you work hard, if you look at all the facts, if you do it fair and with balance, you can get a good, a good outcome. Ten against and one in favour. Might have even been 11 against and one in favour. But there was only one guy that actually, actually voted in favour of it. Cheers, mate. Oh, hi, Mum, it's Piers. Uh, I think it was 10 to 1 or 11 to 1 against. Yeah, just a fucking waste of time, basically. Could, I could have said anything, to be honest. I don't think it would have made any difference. Of course, worried about global warming. I mean, that's got to be something that we're all concerned about. I mean, we're all doing our bit to try and conserve and looking at renewable energy, of course, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we're part of the life. <laughs> yes. And it is global warming. For the first time, scientists confirm the link between climate change and our awful weather. Emergency services scramble to Bedford Swan. As the floodwaters finally worked their way along the Great Ouse, other parts of Bedfordshire didn't escape either. We've lived up here for over 40 years, and we've never, ever... And anything like this. Just 80,000 fatalities in Burma today after Cyclone Nergis. Drought emergency across Western Europe with drinking water strictly rationed in Holland, France. Forest fires which are still sweeping across Spain. 30 billion pounds. Price worth paying for motorists right to drive, said Lord Clarkson. Good news for the UK wine industry, especially. The latest is that New Orleans will not be rebuilt a third time. Said the Louisiana less than the total destruction of India's dams would end Pakistan's drinking water crisis. As US President then Chelsea Clinton refuses Africa's sales of air conditioning units in India. As San Francisco's extraordinary heat wave continues into Los Angeles. Now extreme weather events somewhere on the planet every single day. Estimated 35 million Chinese refugees. Seeing in the Alps is over. New Channel 4 documentary asks, is global warming really happening or a natural... It's 61 degrees centigrade, the highest land temperature. More than 100 million people are homeless tonight. As Massive Bangladesh methane emissions from Siberia. The last Indonesian trip Fell. But biofuel prices are... European Union today permanently closed all of its borders. Roadside verdes must be reserved for food production. London is underwater again as last night's 30-foot storm surge overcame the Thames Valley. New Zealand has also now closed its borders, leaving 22 million Australians. Reports are coming in that the North Sea is boiling. 100 million refugees from Middle East and continental Europe are all heading away. Species are now extinct, scientists say it's made, and ecosystems are collapsing across the planet. past two degrees. We cannot now stop runaway climate change. Very simple too many people feel that Ireland's remaining farmland. Suicide rates increasing 800%. The Amazon rainforest is still burning. And anyone Estimates. who cannot bear to eat their own cats and dogs. Is entering the eighth world food crisis. With uh, world temperatures today passing four degrees. Pakistan has launched a retaliatory nuclear strike on the dead. across the entire continent. We wouldn't be the first life form to wipe itself out. But what would be unique about us is that we did it knowingly. And what does that say about us? The question I've been asking is, why didn't we save ourselves when we had the chance? Is the answer because on some level, we weren't sure if we were worth saving?
en montagne, on est encordé. Le risque est le même pour toi que pour moi. On sait que le réchauffement, il va aller de plus en plus vite. Donc la, la situation va être de plus en plus grave pour tout le monde, pour tout le monde. Please proceed near the aircraft and take care of your responsibilities. You know, if all of us stood united in terms of the world, it would be very different in every way. But unfortunately, that's not the reality. If we can't even stand uh, united on eradicating poverty in the world, what does health of the planet have any chance? Through being a medical doctor, I really want to be famous. I know it's not easy, it's hard work, but that's my dream. I should say congratulations. You can see that your documents are okay to give you admission. Thank you, sir. In my opinion, our use or misuse of, of resources the last 100 years or so, I probably would rename that age uh, something like the, uh, the age of ignorance, the age of stupid. بعض الأهل كليات بيجوا يعني فرح بسيف فرح فش منه بالعرف كله بالعالم كله Je pense que toutes les personnes à l'avenir, ils nous feront aussi peut-être le reproche de, de ne pas avoir pensé à préserver toute cette nature. On a su en profiter, mais on n'a pas su préserver. I just find it surprising that after so much effort, the final act of our existence should be suicide. So why did I build this archive? It's a cautionary tale. Not for us, too late for us, but for, well, for whoever, whatever, eventually finds this recording. Where you go?